Um, this is a very exciting call uh, and we have two very interesting guests who will be sharing with us for a, a conversation. It's, it's a short conversation, a short call, but the idea uh, behind the open climate calls is that we're trying to map um, the use of data from a more broad perspective of who generates it, uh, who, how is data generated, who uses it, for whom. And I believe that um, the most common view of data is high level decision making, but it's not the only one. Uh, so we wanted to start uh, a series of calls by speaking to different people who are using data in different ways to, to see where it takes us and also to, to engage in a community that's uh, connected to openness in different areas. Uh, it could be environmental uh, areas, it could be about open hardware, it can be other things and, and see how data plays a role in all of these. So. Um, we have uh, a very simple structure for this call, which is uh, our speakers will have around 10 minutes to, to present, and then we'll have an open conversation with some guiding questions if they're necessary. Um, so yeah, allow me to introduce to our, our guests. Uh, first, uh, Angela Eaton from Open Environmental Data. She, based in San Francisco and um, she's um, knowledgeable of different uh, subjects such, such as water equity and uh, sustainability. And then Ana Grijalba from the UNDP Accelerator Lab in Ecuador, uh, who's uh, done some work of data for decision-making. So I leave you with Angela first, if you may, please. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Sorry about that. Thanks. So do you want me to just jump right into a presentation and share screen? Wonderful. Please. OK, thanks. Uh, let's see. Share screen. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, environmental policy, I believe, is strongly influenced by industry. But what if community ideals and nature were given equal weight in environmental decision making? Calling out nature here because I believe that we live or should aspire to live in community with our environment and other species. In terms of environmental justice, what I'm trying to affect is the active participation in decisions made about the environment by communities that are often disregarded in favor of the economic interests of industry. So I'm going to pose more questions than I answer, and I'm going to talk about what community participation in data gathering might mean and community held data assets might look like. Why these formal and informal sources of information are important, even when it doesn't fit into accepted scientific method. And then I hope we can discuss. What am I talking about with community or publicly held open data assets? People tend to know what their experiences are. Quantifying those experiences allows communities to discuss those realities productively with government, industry, and as a group. What I've learned is that environmental data gathering has different meeting and approaches based on the, on the community and on the individual. Later, I'm going to use the fires in California to look at the knowledge, data, and information and how it's generated by communities and individuals in ways that can be meaningful. We can talk about their potential, uh, potential to affect future government policy, industry actions, personal action, and personal interaction. So here are some areas that I believe community data projects have greater impact. Producing information with significance in, to the participant scientists, teaching cultural norms and increasing civic participation, creating trust within a community between unrelated individuals and between communities and in industry or government, and elevating and increasing scientific learning through standards development, definition, and common languages. 
One hallmark of community science is that it occurs in many forms and in traditional spaces. Community participation in science is especially effective in spaces valuable to that community and may not look or be designed to work as part of academic research, instead being designed for cultural meaning. When making environmental decisions, we need to understand the importance of community embedded knowledge. In other words, we need to see science in traditional knowledge, no matter how that knowledge is described and seek science in spaces valuable to the community. I'm living on land once stewarded by the Ohlone, the first people of San Francisco, California and the surrounding areas. Many communities protect, uh, practice medicine, memory, land guardianship, and preservation as part of a cultural heritage and have collected lifetimes of location-specific information that if widely and really reasonably adopted are methods that can have an enormous effect on preventing wildfires that plague drought-affected California. This photo is a group of native people along with non-Indigenous university students and locals around the town of Mariposa, California, who gathered for two days of controlled burns. The article this photo comes from describes how the Karuk and Yarg tribes of Northern California have partnered with the Forest Service and managed land for traditional values and wildfire management. The specific knowledge transfer within its cultural context has higher community values, high community participation, and high scientific value. It also promotes high trust since traditions build trust. When conventional fire management systems learn, incorporate and respect native practices, there's better interaction between communities and government. In the past two years, I've also focused on air quality monitoring at SafeCast. And an important issue for air quality and other types of environmental monitoring is that communities have been burned by pseudo participation. This happens when we're given the impression that we can affect change by just putting up a monitor, but we're locked out of the real empowerment of being able to reconfigure our roles with regards to digital services in which we engage. Pseudo participation by design hurts the overall willingness to participate in projects or trust in government. In this case, full participation includes being the author of open data rather than the subject of closed data collection. Here's another look at data from the same event represented by government and by an individual. Um, this is a satellite picture taken by the U.S. Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration of the, of the fires in Southern Washington, Oregon, Northern California, and Northern California as they appeared on September 9, 2020. Where I live in San Francisco is marked with a yellow arrow down at the bottom. On, the day, on that day, a thick high cloud caused by fires hundreds of miles away blocked out the sun, making it look like night during the day. This photo was taken at 1 p.m. in the Mission District in San Francisco. That day, social media was flooded with pictures like this as a document documentation of doomsday. The trouble was that all of our photo, uh, all of our cameras, our phone cameras, are now built to brighten up dark images by moving the white balance. This is the unedited raw version of that photo. A friend of mine took it. In the previous photo, my photographer friend darkened the sky to better reflect what it actually looked like and felt to him. There are thousands of pictures like these that could be better used to understand at some future moment what happened on that day. But I'm asking which image is more important, the scientific, the useful, sci more important, scientific and useful. Um, and it also makes us question how data is collected, um, especially from imperfect data collection devices and the way and relationship of data editing to reflect memory and experience. 
Um, in this relationship between raw and edited data, we must constantly clarify what it means, what imperfect data means, and how data is collected, what self-selection means, what assumptions all of us have, and what the subjective, transient, and temporal experiences affect that data. So I ask you, which image has higher community value? Which image has higher community participation? How can we determine the scientific value of any of these images? And which image do you trust the most? The map image, the lens changed image, or the subjective filtering image? So as I promised, I asked more questions than I answered. I'm looking forward how you, to how you might react to them, to these prompts, and um, would love to start the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, yeah, really cool presentation. Um, and now I would like to open up the space for uh, Anna. Thanks so much. And I, I'm sorry that I, I'm not the one to give, uh, I'm not well prepared to give a, a, an explanation of what the accelerator labs are, but maybe you can <laughs> explain a little bit if you want to. Hi everyone, and thank you so much for the invitation. Happy to share this um, space of discussion with you all. So yes, the Ag Lab Network of Accelerator Labs of UNDP is pretty much a bet that UNDP is uh, taking to think and rethink ways of doing development differently. So I might not cover the whole methodology behind why the Ag Labs do, but just to give you like a brief hint, um, one of the paradigms that the uh, Ag Labs tried to break is this idea that the experts are the ones that have the solutions to the development problems and the work can be done from the desk. So rather than assuming that that's who, who holds uh, the knowledge and the expertise is rather working alongside with the communities, other actors that are involved, uh, working with ecosystems of partners, uh, mapping solutions that already exist uh, are coming from the people that actually struggle with these problems in their daily lives. And then also having a space to experiment and actually know what works and what doesn't. And by failing, also finding a way that that can be appreciated and we can learn from it. And it's also like a positive experience in the sense that now you know that that, that, that does not work. So you definitely can try something different. So that is just like a very brief um, explanation of what the Act Labs work like uh, and what part in terms of development we're trying to um, take ourselves apart from and find new ways of collaboration and work. So that will be like a very brief explanation of what they are and happy to um, keep um, diving into further detail if um, you have like questions after um, our like little discussion. So for now, um, Emilia, let me know if um, you find appropriate that I go ahead with the presentation. Um, I have a few slides prepared for it. It's, um, I'm gonna share with you based on a practical case, how you can use um, open data. And um, I think it's gonna complement very nicely what Angela has presented that actually had a, a different approach on the use and understanding of how we can use data. So I, I guess I have already the permission to go ahead and share my screen. Um, so I'm gonna try to be as brief as possible. I know that I should not take more than 10 minutes uh, or so to, to go over the material. Um, so I'm gonna go some parts very quickly and try to emphasize a bit more um, the data parts, but let me know. Uh, I mean, on the question section, for sure, we can retake some sections and have uh, further detail into different uh, bits of the presentation. Um, so now I'm just gonna present. So today I want to share with you all uh, a specific experience that we had in terms of using this methodology that is called data power positive deviants. I'm not going to give like all the details behind. Actually, I'm just going to share uh, the landing page that we have for this uh, initiative that is being run by the AgLab network. And you can uh, see there is like another set of webinars in that landing page and like further material, blogs and so on, if you're interested. But I want to share with you how based in this initiative um, that has that applies this methodology, 
it was really relevant to actually have access and use data. And for what we use data, it was actually to talk about deforestation and cattle. So um, I just want to very briefly uh, give you some context. Why is it relevant to talk about deforestation in the Amazon region? So I think that I have not mentioned that um, this work was done in Ecuador. That is actually where I work from. Uh, I am from the Ecuador Atlas. So Ecuador, as other countries um, in Latin America, have uh, a bit of the Amazon region. And uh, we were uh, running this research to identify through data uh, sustainable cattle farms. And I, I'm going to cover what we mean by sustainable and how cattle and uh, deforestation, how cattle raising and deforestation are related. So why is it relevant to talk about deforestation? Well, first of all, 99% um, of deforestation takes place because of agricultural practices. And from this number, from the 99%, 64% of it is due because we transform forests into pastures. Not always uh, these pastures are meant for raising cattle. In other cases, it's a previous step to later on uh, plant other sorts of crops or just give like any other use to the land. But this is just to give you very briefly um, some statistics of why is it relevant to talk about deforestation. Then when we talk about data, it's also really key to think uh, of it as an ecosystem, like a data ecosystem, like who holds the data, who has access, who's the owner, what is the frequency uh, in which it is collected, um, do I have a previous relationship with a partner that holds this data, or how should I establish that first uh, approach? So this is why I want to briefly just share with you who has been behind this work. Um, we have a partnership with uh, GIC Data Lab and as well as with the University of Manchester. So they're like um, the ones that were giving the guidelines in terms of the methodology and the, all the data considerations that we could have. Uh, we also worked with the uh, local GIC uh, offices here in Ecuador. They had like a good positioning in terms of having connections with the field. Um, we were also framed in this bigger project that UNDP has, along with other two ministries here in the country, the one from environment and agriculture, which is called Pro Amazonia. So this, this was like the, the most important partnership in the sense that we were able to conceptualize the research problem to understand more about deforestation and cattle racing and to have access to uh, most of the relevant data that we needed uh, to run this research. And finally, well, you have the UNDP Ag Lab that actually run the implementation of this whole initiative and is bringing the results. So that is like a first key point when we talk about data um, to map who has access to this data, where is this data, how can I have access to it and start working out these partnerships. So I'm not going to um, give a lot of detail about data power positive deviance methodology. I just share with you that you can find further information actually in the link that is underneath the slide. But the general idea of this method is it's a mixed method. Um, so we have a quantitative phase as, le as well as a qualitative phase. So on the first phase, um, the whole purpose of this phase is to combine data and then run an econometrical model so that you can identify the sustainable farms based on data. And what do we mean by sustainable? We mean that these farms in terms of their peers have a lower rate of deforestation each year um, that we were looking at. But at the same time, while having that low rate of deforestation in terms of their peers, actually, they also showed to have um, efficient practices in terms of cattle raising. And by efficient practices, uh, we look at how many heads of cattle there were per hectare of pasture. That is pretty much how you talk about livestock efficiency. So once that we identify these farms based just on data, then on the second phase, we want to learn about these practices. We want to understand these behaviors uh, to find commonalities between farmers that are PD, so positive deviants, or are not. And that is pretty much how the method is thought of. And the interesting part here is that you find these local based solutions based on what the farmers are already doing in the field. So it's pretty much easier to extrapolate or make other farmers use these practices since it's uh, it's relevant for the context. So just to 
so that you have an idea in terms of where, when, who. Um, this was run uh, in two counties in the Amazon region of Ecuador. You can see their names there. There's one county that is in the north part, another one that is in the south. Uh, we did this research for five years. So we looked at information over um, 2015, 2020. Um, actually, the research as, it, as the whole took just one year and a half, but we look at five years of the information. And our unit of analysis was the cattle farm. So in terms of data sources, and here I want to share with you what we use. So we use satellite images, we use cattle vaccination registers, we use cadastral data. We also use socioeconomic um, information to better understand the context of these counties. So here is like a first uh, big step in terms of data after having this data ecosystem is to combine different sources of data. And the whole purpose here is to understand what already exists in terms of being open sources of data or public sources of data and what you can do with it. Um, the good side of this is that actually has a lower cost than if you uh, have to create or generate all of this data for the research. The downside of it is that given the fact that all of these sources of information were never created for the purpose of this specific research, you're always gonna have limitations in terms of uh, how updated it is, how accurate it is, or uh, start working with proximity variables because the, the one variable that you actually need does not exist itself um, in any of these different sources of data. So yeah, you can see here that we are combining geographical data with databases. And um, I'm not gonna go over specifically like who owned what, but just to give you an overall sense, the cattle vaccination registers that were owned by the Ministry of Agriculture. This was neither public data, no open source data. Um, another example was the satellite images that we use. You can find um, open source uh, satellite images as well as non open source. So we use the open source precisely because we uh, did not want it to spend budget on actually acquiring satellite images. And the great part of it is that you can do a lot with this sort of information. So you can see that I have two columns where I give a specifics in terms of which of these data sources were public and which were open data. So um, just to give you like a brief definition of the difference between these two, when we talk about public data, it means that this uh, data can be found somewhere on the web. That is pretty much like an easy way to understand it. When we talk about open source data, it means that the way that this data is shared to the public is meant to be reused by the public. So rather than giving you um, a PDF um, document where you can see what I found and what I use, I give you the database uh, access, I give you the shapefile access. So that is the difference between being public and being open source. Um, so that is in terms of the different data sources that we combine and why were they relevant, why we need like this um, broad range of different um, sources of information is because in terms of the econometric analysis, when we talk about the forestation, there is actually a lot that is in play and we were trying to capture as much of the relevant information that we could so that we could include it in the model. I'm not going to give like all the specifics around the model. But just to give you like an overall idea, this is a predictive model where we try to um, take into consideration certain characteristics at the form level and certain characteristics of the context. And then we made an estimation to know what should be the rate of deforestation for, for that farmer, given these two layers of characteristics. And if, and we knew the exact rate of deforestation, right? So when you actually have a difference between what you predicted and what you can see in terms of rate of deforestation. You can see if this farmer, in terms of their peers, they have deforestated less or more, and therefore you were able to find your, your PD, your positive PD, and that farmer that actually may uh, is differentiated from their other peers uh, in terms of their practices. So here again, you can see in an organized way how the different sources of information that I showed you previously um, will give us inputs for the model. So I'm not gonna cover all just for the sake of time, but I want you to have like just a glance of the different categories that are important when we talk in terms of deforestation. So for instance, uh, with satellite images, that was the source of information, we were able to create maps of cover and use of soil. 
So we could knew at the, at the farm level how many hectares of crop that farm had, how many hectares of cultivation of oil palm, resting soil, and so on. Um, then one of the most important variables that we looked at as well was cattle efficiency that I just shared that it was the number of heads of cattle uh, over the number of hectares of pasture. And then other um, relevant um, information in terms of uh, that we took from satellite images so that you, just to go like very quickly over like the different points of how we transform these data sources of these different sources of data into actually like practical variables that we could make sense of for the purpose of this research. So it was also relevant to understand uh, the location of the farm. Were they close to roads? Were they close to agri-infrastructure? Um, for instance, like irrigation systems? Um, were they close to health centers or education centers and, and so on? So uh, once you have the access to all of this data, uh, you have uh, made the analysis that you needed, we were able to find these positive deviance. But by the way that we use the data, we actually uh, created a positive deviance variable for each of the years of the analysis. So you, we could know if that farmer was on 2015 above their peers in terms of performance or not. If they were above, they got a one. If they were not, they got a zero. So then you have this variable of five digits um, that shows you in which year the farmer was were in terms of their peers. So therefore, because we end up with uh, that much information, we realized that some of these farmers could actually be considered like constantly being positive deviants, while others became, like they were not at the start of the year of analysis, but later on they became. Some of them stopped being positive deviants, so no longer PDs. And if we have the time later and the interest, I can just go over the, the graph of this um, distribution and tell you what this 10% means. But here the key idea to stick with is that we created this uh, variable that show us for each of the years whether that farmer was overperforming their peers or not. And based of, on that uh, variable, we could know if that farmer was consistently a positive deviant or became one or stopping one or actually was around the average. Um, and so on. So um, just to thank you again for the invitation. If you want to reach me, I'm happy to share my email for any further detail, contact, or so on. And um, that was like a, a brief summary of the case uh, study that we did in terms of understanding where farmers uh, with uh, sustainable practices in terms of cattle raising are located in the Amazon. And once we knew that based on data, uh, we're actually running the qualitative phase right now to understand better these practices and changes of behavior. So that is all from my side and, and thanks again. Thanks so much. <laughs> um, well, yeah, so, so now we have some space for um, discussion and I, I'd like by, uh, to, to begin by reminding uh, for those of you who are uh, coming to the call that we're organizing these as part of a series of calls to uh, map out how the open source community is working with data and specifically how different stakeholders make different use of data. So um, I'd like, you know, I only have two guiding questions that might help, might not, depending on how everyone else uh, wants to uh, drive the conversation and that is okay. but. Um, I'd like to begin by by taking what really um, drew my interest the most from Angela's uh, conversation that I think that can relate to both, which is the the gap that has to be bridged between experts and non-experts. And I'd like uh, to begin by asking both of you uh, if you can, you know, just tell us. What is your personal view on this gap and how data either helps or uh, is a detriment to that, to that gap? I think uh, one of the things that, um, that I was trying to outline was that there's a lot of different types of information and knowledge and that it doesn't all fit uniformly into numbers and rows, columns and rows, and that um, 
one of the interesting things that I think that we could be doing right now in terms of equity and inclusion is to figure out how to capture um, knowledge that people want to offer into a system, into a data system, and how to uh, make use of that for greater public good to add the to add a community voice. So th that's how I'm looking at it is that that it's um, not necessarily data, but then there is collected um, data that is collected by, um, you know, I gave in, I showed it by phones, but I think that, um, you know, by different types of monitoring devices. And then it's about um, looking at communities and about uh, density of data and how data density within communities created by either individual actions and accumulation or um, as groups decide to do monitoring um, of a system, looking at the asset, um, hopefully it's an open data asset, but looking at the, the data that's c collected around that as being um, the density as being the important part of it, as well as the collection process. Do you have some thoughts, Anna, on this? So up to this point, um, we are actually um, having long conversations to be able to just have the validation of the authorities of both ministries that are involved in Brahma Sanya, to be able to send out an email to their teams and uh, be able to share like what has been done, the results, the databases, and so on. So we are uh, right now in this uh, at this point. Um, so sharing this experience just to emphasize that always the, um, the momentum and the importance on how you make this approach with um, like policymakers and authorities is key so that actually data gets used. Otherwise, um, this information is not necessarily gonna be used because you can not only, not only not, do not have the validation to present it to the, um, uh, the persons that are working within the ministries, but also at the national level, um, you can create a lot of tension if you uh, present results that actually do not have like a national validation by the ministries that run the themes of the forestation and cattle racing. So definitely just to share this experience with you on, on the importance of having this approach and having this validation. Um, otherwise, um, data will just be shared after webinars, but not necessarily in a, in a more insightful way so that you can do policy making based on it. Yeah, thanks. And please, Anna, you want to? Well, if you, if you want to respond to, to that, go ahead. Otherwise, please. I just bring in another perspective. Please. Okay. Um, yeah, I thought I'd add in maybe the, the academia perspective a bit, um, because firstly, your question brought to my mind a, um, a point from a book I'm reading right now. Um, it's called, it's a bit old, uh, 2011, Reinventing Discovery um, by uh, Nielsen, who physicists know from a textbook on quantum information and computation. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a physics student at at ETH in Zurich. Um, that's why those books are quite at the top of my mind. But he also writes books like these. And he was giving many examples of how um, open data was quite uncommon in academia, because clearly academia is driven by the need to, to publish, to be cited. And you know your data is like your, your, your key advantage. Um, so it's something you want to hoard. But um, he, he gives many examples of how uh, opening this up can both support some scientific projects, but also really change the relationship between um, science and society. Um, let's say there's, there's a project called Galaxy Zoo, where there's just a huge amount of data from, I think it was the Digital Sky Survey. And you, know, you can just give people the task of classifying galaxies. You don't need to be an expert with a PhD in astrophysics to do this. Um, and many discoveries came, came out of this. Um, so that just popped in my mind when you said experts, non-experts. Um, I guess open data is a big topic in academia too. And as I said, the book is from 2011. So I'd be interested to see how this has changed because I 
I have the feeling it hasn't changed that much. Um, so that was one point, but um, what I really also wanted to um, say today in this context of open data was um, like my personal perspective right now, because as I said, I'm a student at ETH, but um, I'm very involved in sustainability here. And in particular, um, in a working group that is working on a white paper to make ETH carbon um, neutral. Um, and last week in one of our weekly meetings, uh, we talked about how the two main factors in our strategy link. So what are those two factors? On the one hand, it's, you know, you need a very strong data basis to know what is our status quo right now and where are the most, like where are the key areas where we need to really reduce our emissions as well as work towards negative emissions to make both ends meet because you know you can't can't get rid of all emissions like heating you've got to heat so on the one hand you have data but at the same time you have psychology and cultural change and these things um, but what links the two is transparency um, because we were talking about well once you've got the data how do you how do you really leverage that to get people to actually change their behavior so a positive way to approach this was um, in our view really just transparency. Um, as an example, apparently Edinburgh, the university has a um, platform where the flight emission data of their research groups is publicly available. Um, so you can literally see how much every group is flying. And that implies, well, if you fly, you have a good reason to have done so. It's not, you know, it's, it's fair to fly if you have a good reason to do so but just be open about it share the data and that's like a a way to combine data and psychology to actually make people change their behavior based on the data um so yeah i'm like together with <laughs> the fact that that's today's topic i think i'm gonna think about that more and maybe we can use that to link different Swiss universities to all share their data. So it's like a positive transparency thing to, um, it's okay to fly, it's okay to do different things, but you've got to share the data. Um, and can, can I go and Please. just, uh, yeah, it's just a short comment. Um, well, so thanks both um, Anna and Angela for for those presentations. They they were great, um, and I'm very passionate about all things uh, deforestation related. So, um, actually, like kind of my my question goes a little bit in that line because I was recently um, in a conversation where they were um, showing something very similar um, in the uh, particularly in the Shasuni um, National Park, um, Anna. Um, they were uh, showing this mapping that some scientists were doing with local communities there to identify the um, oil blocks in the uh, National Shasuni Park. And um, I, I was sort of thinking that both of you presented kind of this very like high level data that gets um, extracted from uh, satellites. And then that information, how is complemented with the information that people that are in the ground actually have about their own communities. Um, and not that I have any, like, I don't know if I have like a question around it necessarily, right? But I thought it was like kind of interesting to see how like we go from those satellite satellite data to all the like local um, um, stories and information that is like happening there in, in the ground, right? Um, yeah, and not that I necessarily have a question on it, but but I thought that was interesting to, to see. Absolutely. Um, I think that your comment has actually like two different points. The first one is, okay, once we have this very macro uh, level data as the one that we have been using for this initiative, uh, like how is that even relevant uh, to really know like the, the, the real context? So luckily in the case of this uh, methodology is like a mixed method. So actually once you have identified these farmers through all of this macro information, you have the chance to actually run interviews with the farmer itself and uh, make 
and check if it makes sense what you found on the big data that you were using. And actually what we have come um, up with up to this point is that um, most of these farmers do not necessarily think that they have a forest, you know, like this remaining uh, vegetation that we saw from satellite images, they do not necessarily perceive that as a forest. So when you ask them how you preserve these forests, they, they tell you like, what forest are you talking about? So that is like a first interesting um, uh, like uh, result of this. So here, I, I guess we can have like different hypotheses of why that answer. So first of all is whether the farmer has or not actually like a conscious in terms of the vegetation that is left that we're naming forest. That is like one hypothesis. The other one is that given the fact that at the national level, the definition itself for forest is that it has to be like this massive area of like a real forest that actually also allows to preserve, I mean, also has this function as a habitat for animals. Of course, the forest that we're talking about in the farms, they no longer have animals there. That's like obvious. You only have like this remaining vegetation that provides other sources of um, environmental services, but they are no longer a habitat for animals. So it's also interesting to see how the national um, definition of what is a force and what is not can actually also shape the understanding of the communities of what is a force and what is not. And you could definitely argue uh, in terms of being like very technical, whether that remaining vegetation could even be called a forest, like in terms of how an ecosystem works, the height of the trees, um, is like very important when you talk about especially the forest in the Amazon region and so on. So I guess I like this many different perspectives, but in our case, we had the chance to see if this macro data makes sense in the context because actually it's, it's a mixed method. But I also think that your comment has like a second layer and is, okay, great, we've created all of this information. How is that even useful for the community? Is the community even aware of, of this analysis of this initiative, how they can make use of this um, in a practical way for because they're raising cattle right and we are finding sustainable practices for that, so how is that useful for them. Um, and I think that here is like a, a big paradigm that uh, we were not really uh, able to break on this initiative, but it's something definitely that the Act lab has as a main principle when we use data and is to break this idea that we create data for policymakers as policymakers seen as the like the local or national government the authorities and thinking of policymakers as everyone that actually has a saying or an action in that one uh, theme that you're working on so if you're talking about deforestation and cattle racing farmers are policymakers definitely because they are directly implied with this action so rather than just having this extractivist relationship with uh, when you survey, right? When you go and ask someone, it's more of a, I take information and thank you so much for your time. It's actually breaking that relationship and trying to think the farmer as the main policymaker of this information that we're collecting. As I mentioned before, unfortunately, we were not able to include this vision uh, on this whole work from the very beginning, but this is definitely something, one of the downsides of this work might be the fact that we were not able to put the farmer as the main policymaker and guarantee the use of this data. Also taking into consideration that farmers might not necessarily feel confident with uh, fancy applications or digital applications, like how can you make this data easy to use for them because when we were talking about like public data open data i think that the third step that is equally important is using the data if i share data in a way that just i don't know like two percent of the population can use therefore I'm, I'm failing i have to think about other ways in which i can share this data in a much easy way to consume um so yeah that is what i also, also wanted to comment on your comments <laughs> Michelle, uh, around. yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you both for the really great presentation. And um, a question I had, um, I think you've spoken really well about um, the role of, of data um, in addressing these environmental issues. And, and I was wondering if you had, because one of our questions of doing this series is also around a general hypothesis that the open movement could do more uh, for the climate crisis. 
and whether you had any advice or suggestions or gaps that you'd see when we think about um, the open movement more broadly and how we could, I don't know, better mobilize and be more effective as the open movement in, ad in addressing the climate crisis. Absolutely, I think that the two last, um... I mean, reflections that I that I share might be like a good guide to think about policymakers in this like micro scale rather than macro. So if uh, farmers or the ones that are like mostly implicated with this change in terms of climate change, of course, that is not like because it's their responsibility and the rest of us were not guilty in that sense, but rather because we put pressure in those that actually uh, work with the land or fish so that we can have access to these resources, right? It's like we put pressure that these actions take place. So I think that uh, open climate movement, one way of seeing it is actually thinking of policymakers as these individuals and how we can make data useful for them. So I was, as I was sharing before, it's easy to make, um, it's easy to share for me the results in a shapefile format or uh, on a map on a digital web platform for academia, for instance, or other NGOs that work on environmental issues. But if you ask me, OK, how you make that useful for the farmer, then it's a completely different logic. I would have, first of all, to ask him, I've been collecting this data. What of this data you think is useful for you? Or how can I narrate the data in a way that makes sense for the work that you do? So in that um, regard, it's definitely important to co-design the work that, the way that you're going to share the data with the farmer. Uh, when in the other scenario, it's much easier because it's more of like these standard ways of sharing data, right? Like just uh, databases, shape files, um, web applications, dashboards. Is like a, but who has access to this and actually can use them is not necessarily the farmers in this specific scenario. So I think those are like two practical suggestions on how we can make um, an improvement in terms of um, climate change action by involving those that are actually directly implied through data. So I, I really am enjoying hearing about that because I, I think that that when I'm thinking about the farmers as being um, par primary policymakers and how data is used and who gets to use the data, I'm really looking at um, data as a two-way street. So um, there's the importance of who gets to have a say in you know, whose data gets to be presented at those meetings of high-level policymaking, but then who gets to have a say and how data is presented to the person on the ground doing their policymaking. I'm really interested in that question as you're posing it. So one, one of the things that um, you know, I think a resistance that I felt is this idea that you know, it's not that we have um, that we don't have enough data, we have too much data, but the data is all messy and it's all over the place. Instead of thinking about data as in data collection as an activity that um, draws communities together and starts conversations and equalizes the conversations between participants. So this is one of the reasons that I was looking at pseudo participation in terms of data collection and data action and um, data generation versus actually being able to interact with the data and interact with the systems that change um, what what might the next generation of data be so um, that's kind of how i'm thinking of it i think that the the more open that you have the more transparency there is and then the more level the conversation is amongst all the partnerships of academia, industry, government, um, community, third sector. So those are those are things that I think that I'm interested in. And I think that it, a lot of it is about creating awareness about when you participate in any kind of data generating or data monitoring or data exploration um, at whatever level and whatever part of society that you find yourself in for that moment, because we all reside in those different spaces at different times, that, um, that we are observant that the of how we are collecting that data and then pushing for open to create that transparency. Um, kind of as a, a related question, um, 
uh, the open movement tends to pivot towards like legal openness or like technical openness, like the software does X thing or the the law the license does X thing for X free user. Um, I'm wondering if in your encounters with open and this like literacy problem and access problem that you're describing, Anna and Angela, um, if, if there's like other classes of openness that you would want like the open movement to address, like something other than the legal and the technical openness, but social or communication or format or like it, it, what else is going on there? Would you, would you want from the open movement if we're like, this is openness? I think greater for... interaction. I'd like to pull it out of it just being a scientific endeavor that if you have to have a degree or a, or or some sort of understanding of things on a highly technical, very trained, uh, if that's the only way that you can make meaning out of this data, then, then the, you know, as Anna was saying, the open movement then has failed. Uh, I think it was Anna, it might've been somebody else, but, um, but I, I think that really it's, it's looking at how not just open in, in um, licensing, but open in how we interact with the data and what way, like where, where we do that. So for instance, you know, I'm on my phone and I'm checking the weather. What if I am inputting information about that weather? What if, you know, my experience of that weather, what if um, that helps other people in a greater sense? So I think there's many different ways in which we could do personal decision-making based on public data, sure, but what if that data then also had these other benefits of, um, of creating transparency between groups and being of use for all groups? Yeah, I, I, I think this is really cool. I, I see what Angela is mentioning as, enabler of decision making. It is open as long as it reaches to generate the, the desired impact in the persons who are using that information uh, or that data. Make they, no they mistake, can... I, I believe that it does need to have, uh, it does need to be licensed as open and that it does not, you know, private data, even if it's presented, is still private data. And I have issue with that. But I do think that, um, public facing data still has better use. And then how far can we take that in terms of um, having conversation with each other? Yeah, and, and I, I actually, my second question was on, the, on that line, um, on, on both of your uh, experiences as professionals in, in taking decisions, what role does having the liberties of, uh, remixing, distributing, et cetera. What is the added value that you can uh, express? And I know that that may be a basic question, but I would like still to explore it from your personal perspectives and, and from your experiences in working with other people, uh, et cetera. Angela, please go ahead. <laughs> I'm thinking about the question. So I, I think um, part of it is uh, trying to understand the statement. Could let, let's just let's just talk and see where it leads us. So could you restate it just a little bit? Yeah, I, I, how, how would you describe um, that is the added value that having the liberties of open source give you? Because Anna was mentioning, for example, the difference between public and open and they're both useful but that there's an added value and that is why she was mentioning it so i wanted to hear about this is what's you know it generates this much more impact so i think that with useful. whenever you have closed data systems um or uh hidden data systems even if they're meant to be open but they you know but they're they're not accessible you create um you know, my data versus your data, and we're arguing about, you know, whose data is most 
uh, appropriate to be using for answering this question. And I think that when you have open data, then you're not arguing about the data set and the legitimacy of whose data it is, because if it's truly open, um, one of the things, one of the benefits I see is that it can be, you know, if you feel like there's a data gap, then you can contribute to uh, making sure that that data gap no longer exists. And so there's more participation and there's more of a, you know, we have a baseline of this information and we're all looking at it in the same way. We're all able to participate with it in the same way. It's not you're collecting it and I don't believe you because it's yours. Yeah, there's also one thing that uh, in this context uh, that I think is very important to mention. Uh, like with all the sustainable topics, there's a lot of greenwashing actually going on. And you can actually prove things with open data and open models so that you can have a, a common measure about what is sustainable and what is not sustainable. And I think this is the, the largest value for uh, open data in the area of uh, sustainability. And I think organizations should prove with open data that they are sustainable and not in the other way, declare themselves sustainable. And then uh, later on, somebody uh, asked them, uh, how, how, do you, how do you measure that? And if there is no measure and no way to, 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 uh, to test it or to, um, let's say, to, to, to check if this has really been done or if it's really sustainable, then everybody can declare himself as sustainable and the world is <laughs> rescued, let's say. <laughs> Just my thoughts on that. Yes. So just to very briefly add up and and also just to, to say goodbye because I have another meeting, so I have to run <laughs> to the next Zoom call. Um, would be that um, I think just another reflection when we work with data is to also be honest that there might have been certain points where you could have taken technical decisions differently, and that would have brought you to different results. And that can be seen as a failure of the method or a failure of the decision itself. So just to be more calm in terms of all data can be, uh, we can always have better data quality. We can always uh, like improve the method. So if we're okay with that and we are open to receive critiques in terms of, but why did you use this variable? Like that variable is not updated. That means that your model has um, no um, academic support or so on. That is like always part of the, of the discussion. So I guess if we are, uh, institutionally also back up by these uh, conversations that might have in terms of the validity and importance of data. I think that more um, sources of data will be open because I think most of the fear around data is that what if I know that this data had some issues and I don't want to share because others are gonna know. That is some of the part, not all of it, but a bit of the part. So if we can just share data and be honest on the limitations that it has, it's not the solution to everything. Some of the data is not updated. Some of the data are proxies. Some of the data might have uh, a misinterpretation of the information because of the AI behind it. If we can just be like more honest in terms of these limitations that data has, I think that it will make it easier the exercise of sharing it in the first place. And then it's like the whole logic of who can use it. Is it in the right format? And I think that that is connected to the question that was brought before in terms of how we can be more open. I think in thinking about if I use if I share a shapefile, who can use this? Is that the right format? Is like those two questions are, are good questions to ask ourselves um, to know if like a broader audience is included in the use of this data. So I just wanted to, to share those two last reflections and thank you everyone again for the, the great and insightful conversation. Um, um, we'll be in touch. So um, have a have a nice day. Bye bye. Thanks so much. And bye. Yeah, I think I think we're a little over time, so uh, it's best to close the call to thank both of you, Angela and Anna, uh, and uh, to remind you that on May 25th, we have our next call, and the topic is what content gap questions, what content gap questions are the open movement missing in relation to the climate crisis. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be spamming you on social media and <laughs> we're looking forward to have you there. So thanks a lot.